Welcome to episode eight of the Constitution and American Life with the Friends of Publius. It is morning in America for those of us who label ourselves as constitutional nerds. It seems that every single week we are confronted with new and old constitutional questions that need deliberation or adjudication. This past week, the D.C. Court of Appeals ruled that the president does not have absolute immunity from prosecution in criminal matters. Former President Trump has filed an appeal to SCOTUS, and we are anxious to hear if cert will be granted. Again this past week, SCOTUS heard oral argument on the myriad of questions regarding Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and the authority of states to remove a candidate from the ballot for president who has participated in a prior insurrection. Again, we are anxiously awaiting to hear the court's decision. What a time to be alive. A couple of items before we get to our discussion uh, uh, today. First, we must congratulate the fans of the Kansas City Chiefs for their victory in this past weekend's Super Bowl. I was wrong, and Chris and Mike were right when predicting it would be more of a defensive rather than offensive battle. Congrats should also go out to Taylor Swift and Dark Brandon as their plan to rule the world seems to be working out. And also, <laughs> Tim, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, what was that guy, Usher? I was kind of bored. I was kind of okay. bored. Uh, I mean, the sound is old school R&B, which I was digging. But I, I don't know. There's just uh, I think you know, what the last 15 years, this, the, the, the objective is put as many thousands of people you can on the field, jumping around and dancing or, or choreographing something. I, I don't get that. But I, I like the sound, but I was a little bored. Uh, I was a little bored. All right. There is <laughs> there is our, our music critique of the day, music review uh, here from the Friends of Publius. Glad we could give you some uh some well, things, things about one it. of the friends of Publius. I, I don't know whether I got yeah. any consensus on that. That's true. Uh secondly, if you haven't uh heard or seen yet, we are adding a couple of new episodes to the Constitution and American Life program, which are called Ask the Fops. We have provided an email address for students and teachers to send in questions that uh they would like the group to address. Uh, that will assist in their preparation for the national finals as well as life as a citizen. You can go to the Constitution and American Life uh, YouTube channel and view the announcement video uh, and uh, find uh, the, uh, the email address. We look forward, of course, to your questions uh, here. We hope to uh, have uh, our first uh, uh, segment of the Ask the Fox uh, out the week of February 26th. So let's get to the program, today's program. I am so excited about our topic of discussion uh, here in episode eight. Students from unit three are asked to analyze the consequences and significance of the Brown versus Board of Education Topeka, Kansas case. Why am I so excited about this topic? Well, I believe it allows the FOPs to address in a thoughtful and civil man manner, a topic that Professor Diana Hess from the University of Wisconsin says that most teachers, students, and in all honesty, Americans try to dance around or at worst avoid altogether. There has been, in my mind, since the mid 1970s, a concerted attempt to ignore the controversy surrounding Brown. Dr. Hess says, uh, Dr. Hess lays out for our readers in an article that I think you might find interesting and will post deconstructing the Brown myth that there are five different perspective assessments of Brown that have emerged over the decades since the decision. First, Brown as a rightful icon. Secondly, Brown as a liberation reverent that is used uh, by more contemporary groups as an example of how uh, you can uh, uh, achieve democratic uh, uh, joy and nirvana. Three, Brown as unfulfilled promise. Four, Brown as well-intentioned heir, and five, Brown as irrelevant. Hopefully our discussion here for the next hour will provide some insights that allow you to determine <clears throat> which of these categories you identify with and how you will assess the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. So let's begin our discussion with Professor Moore. Tim, we're, uh, we're, we're once again in the question that the students are asked to deal with or once again confronted with the idea 
of revolution. Uh, do you see Brown as revolu as a revolutionary statement or is just another step in the evolutionary status of race relations? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think your your reference to uh, Diana Hess um, is very prescient. Um, that's a that's a great book that's out there. Um, but uh, you know, it uh, as as with most most of my answers, I'm going to say, well, yes and no. Um, on the yes side, I think you can make Brown into a revolutionary. I mean, especially the uh, the first two viewpoints that you expressed. You know, Brown is uh, can be seen in a very positive light, and it uh, it uh, you know it kind of, in, in in that same vein, it kind of fits what we believe about ourselves. Mike has raised the issue many times uh, in these episodes that national narratives are important. Whether they're right or not is a different question, but national narratives um, uh, are are very very important, and so I think Brown does fit that national narrative about. You know the arc of history bends towards justice, and and I think we like that um, those moments um, where uh, you know you can configure things as being just and righteous, and and uh, it, you know in Brown's case it's about time. <laughs> so I think it can be seen in a positive way. Now, does that make it revolutionary? Well, uh, maybe it overturns Plessy. The court doesn't overturn itself very much, as as students and teachers probably know. Um, it's also revolutionary in the sense that there's backlash. <laughs> and the backlash, in a way, kind of, the, the, I mean, the Southern Manifesto. I mean, uh, those 100 plus folks in Congress, both, I think, both senators and uh, representatives, if I'm not mistaken, they saw it as revolutionary. And in the Southern Manifesto, they, you know, judicial overreach. This is this is the end of the Constitution as we know it. So the reaction might play into that notion that it's revolutionary, but not in a in, in a positive way. They see it as a negative, uh, you know. And there's also, um, you know, uh, Zora Neale Thurston, an African American woman. I think she may, mainly was interested in sociology more than law, but she had a very visceral response to the Brown decision. Um, in fact, there's a um, we'll put this in the uh, in the resources that she wrote a blistering letter, I think, to one of the Florida newspapers right after it came out, uh, saying you know that she objected to it. She thought it was ridiculous. Well, actually, she thought it was racist, and she uh, so she saw it as is a remarkably bad decision. Now, does that equal revolution? I, I, I'll, let, I'll let the students decide that. On the no side, there was a buildup of precedent before Brown. And I, I don't remember, Chris could probably uh, tell us more about that uh, than I can, but there was a series of cases that the NAACP had brought starting, I think, in the 20s addressing graduate schools, uh, law schools. And so there were precedents that the NAACP created, and Brown, in a sense, is seen as kind of the logical conclusion to your question, logical evolution. So it didn't come out of nowhere. There, there's precedent and buildup. Um, so I, I think uh, you know, it's you can also say it's not revolutionary because we still have, we still have uh, this tremendous segregation problem, and I think that goes to the point four and point five of your introduction, David, that we still are addressing these issues. Um, and also in the document, in the decision itself, there's this totally cop out, well, excuse me, non-revolutionary words with all deliberate speed. Well, it's not like the court is saying, hurry up and desegregate and do it now. All deliberate speed I mean, <laughs> if I'm a if I'm a if I'm a racist, and I hear that, I can drag my feet ad infinitum. So I think the all deliberate speed part of the decision may militate against it being quote revolutionary or or you know overly significant the way it's it's been construed to be. Well, and and again, I know this is, and I think we probably you know need to come up with our political science categories here. 
uh, you know, socially it, it, it might arise, I guess. And I'm, I'm probably the most bothered by the, by the use of revolutionary as frequent as it is used, uh, I think in civic education or in government classes and things like that. Uh, but, you know, I can see some social uh, aspects of this, although I, I revert back to evolutionary because we've already had President Truman desegregate the United States Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. We've already had uh, America's leading sport, baseball, desegregate itself uh, there and allow uh, black players into Major League Baseball. So I even wonder to the degree socially. But the question yeah. asked about well, but law. on that social, I mean, on that social train, that social thought, uh, some of the evidence that was used is also, in a sense, could be seen as revolutionary. Uh, you know, the doll test, Kenneth Clark, and the kinds of evidence that was used to prove the badge of inferiority piece. Uh, now, it there had been some social science research used in a couple of other cases early in the 20th century. But the doll test and how that showed, I think it shows up in a footnote, if I'm not mistaken, in the decision. So the, the evidence could be conceded, it could be construed as, you know, um, again, revolutionary is such, such a pejorative word, but the evidence, the pieces of the evidence are quite remarkably different. Yeah. Right. And, and the, and the kids are asked about, you know, it, 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 is it, you know, has been, or I guess the, the framing of the question says that it's revolutionary statement of race relations law. And so I look at that field of law and I'm yeah. going, I, I just don't see a revolutionary statement here. And, and Tim, I think you've touched on it. We have previous cases here in which the desegregation process of certain institutions in this country had begun, all right, uh, I think, in, you know, somewhere in, in maybe 20 years beforehand. Uh, you know, that the legal revolution probably had had, you know, had already begun. And that's why I see Brown as possibly more evolutionary. Chris, where are you at on that? Um, I think it's I think it's more evolutionary than revolutionary, though. I would argue that the introduction of the Clark Dahl studies uh, in terms of sociological uh, influence on the court, I think that is revolutionary. I think it is important for us to be able to take in. I think it was important for the justices to take into account the realities of the society. I mean, and I think that's important. So the the admission of that uh, by uh, Thurgood Marshall is really important. And Tim is right, though. I mean, the, the NAACP legal defense team has been laying out uh, this strategy for a long period of time. And in resources, I included a link to information on a guy named Charles Hamilton Houston, who yeah. is a, uh, uh, the you know, he was the mentor for Thurgood Marshall. And unfortunately, he goes miss quite a bit. And he it, that link will have that information for that strategy of kind of how they're going to attack this uh, piecemeal, in a way, uh, uh, to try and end desegregation. But I do think that it's, I think, um, I think it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. But I do think the introduction of some of that evidence is revolutionary. And, and not necessarily a bad thing. Mike, um, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a close call. Um, so I, I, I like the way both Tim and Chris have kind of given both sides. Um, you know, I I, I relearned some stuff by looking on this question. And, um, you know, it wasn't a slam dunk for Marshall to argue the argument that he made in terms of making this argument that anytime there's segregation, it's inherently unequal, like it's inherently violating the 14th Amendment. And I think that, that principle that comes out of Brown is, is such a strong statement. It, it's such a, a hard statement to live up to, right? There, there are different ways the court could have articulated that. I think that language um, presents it, I, I can see how at the time you would think, wow, this is this is a little different than what Truman did. It's a little different about Jackie. This is big because this is affecting kids, right? Well, on the heels of this, you know, we have Emmett Till, we have the Southern Manifesto. We have this, what you could call the backlash, David, might be just seen as the counter-revolution of like, all right, um, that's what you say. Now, now do something about it. I know we're going to talk about that. Um, 
but I think living up to this promise that um, separate but e unequal, separate but equal is inherently unequal and unconstitutional sets the bar really, really high um, for the court in future years. And the court has, I think, kind of scampered back from that as well. And I could I could throw in the argument for revolutionary because if you I mean, this is such a fascinating case because so much has been written uh, through using justices notes. And we know that Frankfurter and um, Jackson were, you know, in favor of integration and opposed to segregation. But they, you know, they struggled with how to get there. And, you know, uh, is J Justice Jackson, I think it was writing that the idea was like, how can we say that, okay, how, how do we wake up today and decide that, you know, three quarters of a century of law is changed because nothing has changed. I mean, the amendment, the 14th amendment is still there. Plus he, they thought uh, was rightly decided. Um, and by the way, the students, I'm going to quibble with Tim just a little bit. Brown doesn't overturn Plessy. So just beware. Uh, Plessy was public accommodation and, conveyances and Brown is in education. So it doesn't necessarily overturn Plessy, but it is a step in that direction. Sorry, Timmy. Um, I, I, you know, I have to concede that technically you're right. Yes. Thank you. Um, but I think that, you know, so in a way that is revolutionary because as Jackson said, you know, you know, how are we waking up today in three quarters of it's, you know, 75 years of, of law set of laws now no longer good. So in a way that could be considered revolutionary, but I think I want to, I want to um, approach the question and David, you alluded to it, the way you read that question, race related law, right? And therein lies the issue, right? The law. So the law can change, but I don't want to get out of myself here. Well, yeah, I mean, we're going to, we want to talk about that. Um, like I said, I, I think it, it we could plausibly argue that, you know, because of, as Tim says, the backlash, that the, the cultural implications of this could be revolutionary. Yeah. I just, given that there are decisions that precede this, maybe not, and, and, and at least one of them I know isn't necessarily specifically with African-Americans, but they are with Latinos. And that's the Westminster case that, what is it, three, four years before Brown? All right, argues for desegregation in, in California and in, in my old hometown of uh, Huntington Beach, Westminster, that area, that the segregation of Latino students was unconstitutional, uh, you know, uh, at the time. So, so that's why I, I guess that's where the, the, the distinction I make is in law, I see some precedents working up to it. Culturally, yeah, I also see some things, but I can see how Brown, especially, you know, Tim's you know, identification of the visceral reaction. Uh, to Brown and the fact that you know what we don't really get any major shift as far as uh, on Brown and what until three years later, right? Isn't well, it? Uh, isn't it Little Rock? Well, that's fifty-seven is Little Rock, but I think yeah. honestly, Brown itself is um, even though even though the court has, a, I mean, there is a strategy in the court that we're not taking cases, right? You, we've done Brown and we've done Brown too with all deliberate speed that Tim alluded to. And there are certain cases now these, you know, people are appealing because, hey, we want to do this. We want to do that. We're not taking them. Fix it. Yeah. Right. So they're they're actually in a way the court is somewhat stonewalling when they're not granting cert to some of these cases. Right. Um, but, uh, oh, shoot, I lost my my awesome. Uh, well, uh, I, I, so, I, no, so the Civil Rights Act, 64. Really, it, it takes the Civil Rights Act of 64 to really give Congress the power to step in to start really doing the things that need to be doing because the court, again, you know, all the court can do is issue an opinion. It takes other people to take action. Well, and there are, I mean, Tim's already mentioned, I think one of the poison pills in, in Brown and that is Brown too. And that is at all deliberate speed. You gave resistors just what they needed to drag their feet. But the other one, Chris, I think you touch on here is, yeah, the Supreme Court says, <laughs> or, we're not going to be touching this anymore, but they give it to federal district courts. And federal district courts are now in charge of enforcing Brown district by district, region by region. And you're kind of going, really? The the, the federal well, district courts? Even, are actually, David, it even goes lower than that because you go to state courts in areas, you know, in, at state level, and they're trying to do end runs around it. And this is the Supreme Court. No, you know, fix it. 
but you, that's but in the end i think you'd agree with me that's it, in the end the meat goes to the federal district courts because yes it's going to go down to the state courts but they anticipate yeah. legal resistance at the state level so they want all of their lieutenants at the federal district court letter level to be really clear about this is what we expect you to do if you do face that resistance uh, at the state level uh, I, I have a question about on this, uh, it's such a great question, revolutionary or evolutionary. You know, I'm thinking about uh, a couple years later, uh, Heart of Atlanta. You know, so they, they there's this decision where they say, you know, you can't segregate, but we're not going to use the 14th. We're going we're to use, I think they use the Commerce Clause, if I'm not mistaken. Well, they, use the, they, use, they use the 14th as well, and that's the section okay. five, the ability, okay. to, we, can, we have the power. Right, to okay, okay. But it does doesn't heart of Atlanta's uh, use of the Commerce Clause kind of say, you know, Brown wasn't that revolutionary because we're going to duck in large part the Equal Protection Clause? I mean, I just wonder about that heart of Atlanta case. What does that prove about Brown? It, it, well, I think what that shows is the federal government was serious about enforcement. Because, you know, honestly, part of it also speaks to the, the poor job the court did post-Civil War. In interpreting the 14th yeah. Amendment, because yeah. does, it govern, does it govern private action or does it uh, does it only control government yeah. action? And I think okay. that if you look at the framers of the 14th Amendment, they'll tell you they thought it was going to control private action, but through some really bad court interpretations, uh, it doesn't. I think uh, Professor Foner, uh, F O N E R, speaks uh, a yeah. great deal about this in, in his uh, book, The Second Founding. Yeah, he said, in fact, he implies that the civil rights cases of 1883, which you referred to, Chris, did more damage in the long run than Plessy did uh, as as far as our ability to create some kind of, you know, uh, harmony, if that's possible in our republic amongst uh, the races. So let's get to, I think, what you were foreshadowing there, uh, Chris, and that is, you know, I, I think we all refer back to, and I think it's one of the editions of the We the People book going back in time in which uh, they refer to President Eisenhower's kind of view uh, of this. And because uh, uh, this question kind of implies that the court through law can bring about meaningful social change. However, Eisenhower, uh, in response to the Brown decision, said you can't change people's hearts merely by laws. So I'm wondering, what do you think about those disparate views about the power of law? The question, and I think there are there's a group in America that thinks that the court can, in fact, change uh, the, the the social dynamics uh, of society of our society. Whereas Eisenhower is kind of going, you know, you can do with the law all you want, all right, but if you don't change the hearts and minds through other uh, pathways, the law is not going to mean much of anything. So, what's your thought on that? Um, well, Eisenhower also says some other things that I'm not sure that I can say on this program about. Uh, uh, young white girls going to school with young African-American men. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, Eisenhower was not an integrationist, that's for certain. But he was certainly a president that was going to enforce the law, as Tim alluded to with Little Rock. I think he's right. I mean, it's clear. I mean, one of the things I do in my class is like uh, have every kid stand up that has a driver's license. And I tell them, okay, remain standing if you always drive the speed limit. And of course, nobody ever remains standing. I say, so you're all lawbreakers. So the law doesn't control your behavior? Uh, no, there's flow of traffic. No, no. So, of course, it doesn't. The law doesn't. But the, I think I can make the argument that by having finally having a floor, right, that Brown gives us, and certain or other cases that you, we've alluded to, uh, Bowling v. Sharp is one that kids might want to look up for sure. But when we have that floor now, it provides people that legal argument to move forward. And over time, we get those greater reinforcements. So the law itself, no. And this is why I would challenge students when you look at this question, being revolutionary in law and race relations law. Yeah, it might be revolutionary in law, but not in practice and certainly not in society, because as Tim alluded to, there's going to be a great deal of backlash uh, you know, this is going to happen. We're going to close all of our schools. We're going to try and have charter schools in the South. We're going to, you know, all do all kinds of things to try and avoid what's happening. But at least it provides a floor for us to move forward. So is it, you know, Eisenhower's right. 
I mean, actually, there's an, there's an old black folk tale. I think I probably told it before that, you know, that uh, they use it, I use it as an introduction to my civil rights unit that there's a, 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 a fox chases a goose up into the tree and the fox is trying to tell the goose, hey, didn't you hear about this meeting that uh, we had down at the hall the other night? All the animals got together and we're, you know, no other animal is going to hurt any other animal. And the goose is like, really? And the fox is like, yeah, the lion mustn't catch the sheep and yada, yada. And they go through this and in the distance, the, they start to hear this hound barking, right? And so the eventually the fox is starting to slink off because the hound's getting closer. And um, uh, the goose says, hey, wait a minute, what about that What about that meeting up at the hall? And, and the fox said, well, some animals around here don't have much respect for the law. And, I mean, it just, we see that. And we, we see that uh, no matter what the law says, that's not going to change people's hearts. Right. And, and it just, so Eisenhower's right. It doesn't, but again, the argument is, I think that having legal standing under Brown and other cases does provide a floor for us to move forward. So professor Williams, it is, it's my view that if we take a cost benefit approach analysis approach to Brown, um, that its overall short-term and long-term consequences are negative, all right, or at least don't even come close to achieving what goals might exist in the decision. Uh, an example of a short-term consequence is, and I, 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 I had the number around here somewhere, but it's, it's, it's somewhere like a thousand African American teachers um, lose their jobs. Um, in, in these desegregated schools, they're not bringing these African-American teachers into those schools. They lose their jobs, which is a whole class, all right, uh, especially if we look in the southern states of educated African-Americans having an influence on culture who are now, it seems to be removed. To me, that's a short term uh, a consequence. Uh, but uh, I'd like to ask you, do you agree with me that in both the short and long term, in the end, you know, Brown makes us feel good, but its impact is minimal. I think I agree with I agree with half of what you're saying. I think in the short, I think, I think the short term <laughs> consequences are uh, a little more than you're giving credit for, and not based just on the legal decision. I just like we've been talking about. It sets. I think it really sets the stage for the 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 start of the modern civil rights movement. I mean, the bus Montgomery bus boycott st starts in 55. I, th I think there was this air of like, okay, not only did the Supreme Court, this court that the black population knows what the Supreme Court's been deciding since Reconstruction. There haven't been too many wins, right? They get this unanimous, unanimous, unanimous decision I think that lens it puts a little wind in the sails of like, okay, maybe it's time to use this as leverage to do other things. And this is where I think a, a combination of all the different civil society actors and government actors comes into play. So I think in the short term, I think it, it in some cases galvanized the movement. Uh, what Tim was saying, it sets a floor. It's reminding us of what we like to say about ourselves. It's going to be you know, one more thing that we can hold people up to the mirror and say, you know, do we really believe this or not? That I think there's some short term there. The long term, I think, you know, I completely agree with you in terms of, you know, schools are as segregated as they were um, when Brown was at, when Brown was written. Um, there was a period, as I was doing my research up through the mid 1960s, of course, where it wasn't just Brown, but it was Johnson's War on Poverty. All the, you know. We're not only seeing we're we're just seeing a lot of these uh, statistics change a lot, right? I mean, black poverty is cut in half in the mid nineteen sixties. We see that more school more uh, children are in uh, desegregated schools. Test scores that the gap between white and blacks is narrowing. That all stops pretty abruptly in the late sixties, early seventies, and definitely through the eighties, where we are today. So. I would agree with you. And, and then to your point, Dave, I was thinking about this. It's been the last four or five years through different things I've been reading, podcasts, that I, I, I learned for the first time, to be honest, about the effect this had on Black um, school administrators and teachers. And, you know, I must have learned Brown 
two or three times in college. I definitely learned it two or three times in law school. And maybe it's not the job of a law school to talk about these sorts of political and social consequences, but we never really held Brown up to a critique of like what happened to ordinary people, right? It was more just looking at it based on the legal decision and what, what Warren did to get the court to come together. Um, so I think that, that I'm glad that that history is is probably for, for the students watching this more known to them that they just kind of, they know that kind of like, similarly, like I, I never learned about the Tulsa race riots all through all my years of school, right? And now it feels like that that's getting out there more. So I, I think as we learn more about this history, it is going to put, it puts Brown in terms of thinking about the long-term consequences is like, kind of like a shrug of the shoulders, like, okay. Uh, what's that decision done for you lately? And it hasn't done a lot for a lot of groups lately. Well, and I find it interesting. It, it is in many ways, um, a, from what I understand, and then again, anybody jump in on this, but is is Derek Bell, one of the key proponents of what we, you know, <laughs> now delve into uh, legal and race relations uh, 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 theory here, but it it was Brown in which he articulates, um, and I'm I, I I'm sorry I forget the term. I don't know if it's intersectionality or some term of of the reason. One of the reasons why Brown is 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 upheld as as this iconic wonderful decision is because uh, white people like it, because in the last analysis it doesn't push. For the kind of change that 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 many African Americans thought initially was going to happen, that in fact, uh, you know, and, and in fact, I think some of you have read uh, uh, the scholarship here uh, on Brown that a lot of scholars see it as as the court considering the Cold War uh, elements here um, uh, that uh, uh, we could not be morally superior uh, to the communist world uh, if we had this social system by law. Uh, there that segregated the races, but as long as we kept it as desegregation and not integration, and that's right, probably at least initially, Chris, Brown doesn't call for integration, it calls for desegregation, which is kind of a passive thing, whereas integration is an aggressive thing. And the moment we get into integration in the late 60s, as Mike kind of talked about, then you really, I mean, there's initial pushback, but now we see pushback in the north, in the north. Boston. Boston, Boston uh, being probably the epicenter of that, yeah, uh, there kind of stuff. So I, I found it interesting in my own research, Mike. That that, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't believe it. I'm having a brain fart here. What's the what's the controversial uh, th uh, race theory that uh, the governor of Florida doesn't want touched? What's it called today? Replacement. No, well, that's one. I'm talking about the 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 out of law schools. Oh, um, critical race, critical race, critical race. Critical race. It, it, my understanding is it, it, one of the in, inspirations for that is, in fact, the failure of Brown, at least from the mind of Derek Bell. And, sure. that, you know, and, and, you know, so that theory really begins to develop in the 70s yeah. uh, there because of the of the failure uh, of Brown. Uh, any of you want to add anything to Mike uh, as far as the long and short term consequences? Well, I think it's I think I don't know if this fits here, but um you know, the, the quote uh, that's in the question is taken from, I think, a law, maybe a law review article that was published in 1968, right? And so when the author of that review says that this is a, uh, you know, he calls it a revolutionary uh, race relations law, um, there's, I'm not sure there's been enough water under the bridge to be able to say that it's truly revolutionary in 1968 because we've only had the, the Civil Rights Act since 64 and the voting rights since 65. So I think the students would be well to understand that, uh, you know, what was in that uh, professor's lens when he's writing that law review article. Uh, maybe not enough water under the bridge to truly assess the effect of the decision. So, Tim, I struggled, and this question almost sounds redundant to the question I asked Chris, so I'm trying to figure out a way to possibly rephrase it. Um, but again, the question seems to imply that judicial decisions, uh, what we'll call landmark decisions, somehow have this magical transformative impact on society 
uh, to to significantly change the uh, the attitudes of of the people, uh, you know, the American people. And I'm a little skeptical of that. And I and I was kind of going in my mind thinking both of structural cases that might deal with federalism or separation of powers or something like that, as well as rights cases in which a case, you know, helped change the, the, the minds, the, the attitudes of people. I, so I was thinking of Roe versus Wade, but that got me thinking it's almost a chicken and egg thing. Is Roe, Roe, is Roe a byproduct of social attitudes already changing Road and Roe just helps you know emphasize that, or we can look at uh, Lawrence, or we can look at Windsor, or we can go. We can look at is Brown. Does Brown happen because the social attitudes are already changing, or does Brown actually is it a starting point for social attitudes to change? Yeah. Um, well, there's I I'll, uh, I I don't have it here, so uh, I don't know. Maybe Chris does because I know I gave Chris. Uh, Gerald Rosenberg's The Hollow Hope. There it is. Uh, this was a remarkably wow. important and controversial book. Uh, Gerald Rosenberg says no to your question. Uh, a resounding, a resounding, um, a resounding no. And he, 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 it's a very fascinating book. I really think every every teacher in the We the People program should read it because it addresses that question directly. And uh, Rosenberg says, look, there's two views of the court, the dynamic court where it can do all of these social, you know, it can, it, it leads the parade. Um, and then he says, there's this other view and he calls it the constrained court. And he has three things that constrain the court. Uh, you know, one is uh, rights. America's infatuation with rights often constrains the court because rights claim tend to be like absolutist. So the court can't do certain things because rights and our infatuation with them prevent the court from doing things. So that constrains the court. Another thing that constrains the court is what he he calls the co coordinate branch problem. This is why Eisenhower is remarkable. Uh, the court needs the other, you know, he they got to get cooperation from the other branches. They can say whatever they want. That's kind of uh, Hamilton's, uh, all they got is their pens. Uh, they don't have purse or, or, or sword. Uh, and then the third constraint is uh, is a full throated Federalist seventy eight. You know, uh, they uh, they I think that's where he articulates they don't have the sword of the purse. So for Rosenberg, there's a lot of reasons why the court can't do much that constrain the court. Now uh, he does say it's possible, but you've got to get the coordinate branch problem solved, uh, and you've got to get society. So in that regard, according to Rosenberg, they're really they follow society and they kind of read the, you know, is is there enough critical mass behind this before they quote issue these these remarkable decisions? So Rosenberg's answer is heck no, uh, the constraint the constraints on the court don't prevent it from. Now I think Miranda is an interesting example because I'm I'm convinced that cop shows are the reason everybody knows Miranda rights. <laughs> We've had like three, four decades of cop shows where, you know, anything you say can and will, you know, that whole speech that, you know, every arrest on, on TV or the movies, you know, you have the Miranda rights. So I think the media in some ways <laughs> helps some of these decisions, especially Miranda, I think. Uh, well, didn't, didn't know, Rehnquist actually reference that? It, it, in fact, when Miranda was challenged in the last few years of Rehnquist's yeah, life I and think role he did. as Chief yeah. Justice, I think yeah. it is to say he references the fact that that this has become such a part of our culture. Yep. We can't yep. turn back the clock right. uh, uh, there. Um, and Roe is suspect because, well, uh, and Roe is interesting. The court yep. just overturns it. But one would one might say, you know what, Roe changed cultural attitudes to the point that the majority of Americans now are upset. It seems by polling that the court did overturn it. Chris, you were going to jump. Well, in. I think I think the culture thing. I think uh, circulating amount amongst a lot of evangelicals. Um, I I think my sense of it is, you know, the 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 trimester approach, the viability, the viability rule of Roe. I think there's a wide perception within evangelicals that the society has moved so far beyond the viability 
um, you know, the viability principle. So there's that backlash, I think, against Roe. Uh, and Rosenberg addresses Brown and, and Roe in this book. And his argument is society is moving in this direction and the court is, is behind the parade rather than in front of the parade. So Roe figures prominently in, in Rosenberg's book. Yeah, the thing is, and I would tell the students, take a look. Chapter two in the Rosenberg book is fantastic. And also the last chapter where he talks, he calls it the flypaper court, a very fascinating take yeah. on things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, look at the number of states that had integration in schools prior to Brown and look at the states that had segregation. So, you know, there, there were already the country was moving that way. Um, back, back to the whole point that, you know, Jackson's talking about how do we wake up this morning and strike down 75 years of jurisprudence. But the thing is, this, the country had been moving that way anyway. Uh, what changes? Well, uh, the country, I mean, I always bring this up with my classes. We go from Plessy to Brown. We have no new laws. There are no new laws. There are no new amendments. We still have the same laws and the same amendments. What changes? The people change. And in this case, the court changes. I mean, I mean Vincent dies. I mean, the court, this, this case is argued twice. And in the interim, uh, Justice Vincent dies. And by the way, here's a, <laughs> I don't know if this is appropriate, but it always cracks me up. Justice Franksfurter said, this is the first indication that I've ever had that there is a God. So, <laughs> um, so that changes. And the same thing is true, you know, from uh, Bowers v. Hardwick. To Lawrence v. Texas, Dave, you yeah. mentioned Lawrence. Yeah. So what changes? Nothing changes legally. What changes are people and the perception. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the court is kind of, in a way, sweeping up after the parade. And I think with Roe, though, even Justice Ginsburg said, perhaps maybe we got ahead of the country there a little bit. So and I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers, but uh, I mean, she kind of alluded to that yeah. point with the decision that the court handed down in Roe. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I completely agree with all this. And Rosenberg's book is a classic. Um, Controversial. Both, yeah, and in both law school and graduate school, Rosenberg's book was always paired with another book that we'll put into our show notes by Michael McCann called Rights at Work. We're looking at um, the role of courts in pay equity. And he comes to a different conclusion than Rosenberg. And in that area, he shows how legal mobilization actually really does help to accomplish the goals of the reformers. So, um, and and there's a lot of this work going on, like in countries like South Africa, legal mobilization strategies are really, really big and important. Um, the difference I think being that in a case like South Africa where the constitution has positive rights and the courts can say, based on this constitutional ar article, you're not only violating this, but you now need to take action. Like, and it's not all deliberate speed language, right? It's like, get going now. So I think students should be thinking about, there are definitely sort of limitations just in terms of the structure of our of the federal government and the limited, I think both limited um, ability of the court to, to make other branches do things. And the fact that we have justices that can serve you know, for long, long periods, it makes this analysis a little harder to know which is coming first and what's leading it because the justices probably are sitting on the court way longer <laughs> than they should be. And maybe the norms are kind of passing them by, right? And they're not they're not seeing it as much. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I'll put this in the show notes, but there's one other case I would tell the students to take a look at in terms of talking about moving I don't know, say moving society forward, but in terms of expansion of rights or recognition of rights. And I uh, read v. Reed, Reed versus Reed, uh, which is a fascinating case in terms of uh, women's rights to be treated equally under the law. Uh, fascinating case. And I'll put something in the show notes about it. So, you know, we're talking about African-American rights. We're talking about uh, perhaps uh, LGBTQ rights and now also women's rights. So the court, again, back to that idea maybe establishing that floor uh, for folks. Well, you used the term ruffle feathers there, Chris, and we don't want to ruffle feathers. Well, speak, just speak for yourself um, here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't mind if we do it. I've all. never been one to ruffle feathers, David. Yeah. You know. um, I want to kind of get to Diana Hess's uh, uh, material here. Um, and I don't know if she's overtly critical of, of, of classrooms and, and teachers, or she's just pointing out that there's, 
a gap here in the fact that uh, very few teachers. She is. She is. Okay. Uh, I uh, yeah. <laughs> I've met her, but I know you know her a lot better than I do, Tim. Um, uh, but she points out that you know one of the reasons that we have this issue today is that you know the controversy of Brown and the legacy of that controversy is not touched in the overwhelming majority of classrooms in 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 America. Um, that uh, few few teachers address the core issues of Brown, the response to Brown, and as Mike said, in a very realistic way, that we kind of praise it, worship it, and then move on uh, kind of stuff. Aren't, aren't we just a good country and a good people uh, uh, for this kind of thing? Um, uh, so, and, and that's my interpretation of, uh, of, of, of Professor Hess, and Tim seems to affirm that. Why do you think that is, Chris? You're you're the one remaining classroom teacher in in uh, in high school uh, these days. That's why I'm asking you. But all all of us can have been there at one time or another. Uh, so, and I'm wondering, how do you approach Brown uh, uh, in your classrooms uh, since you are the only remaining uh, classroom teacher uh, here? Well, I, I um I one I I approach it because it's a great story. You know, and I do like to, I, I mean, my one of my favorite stories is uh, the Barbara Johns story and her case is rolled into Brown. The most people don't really, you know, people we study Brown, it's, oh, you know, uh, I, I, I'll give you the answer. But, you know, there are five cases rolled into one and one is Barbara Johns, who's a 16 year old uh, African-American girl who leads a walk out of her high school. And, you know, she, the Klan shows up and burns a cross in her front yard at our, our Moton High School in rural Virginia. I mean, the, 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 the courage of one kid to do this in the face of the Klan. Um, and you know, the, the, her, her uncle was a guy named Vernon Johns, who was a preacher at the Dexter Avenue Baptist church in Montgomery, Alabama, who was a very influential preacher. So he had to drive up to, to get her and get her out of town. So she was not lynched by the Klan for leading a walk out of her school in the early 1950s to have the courage to do this. Now, the whole other thing is like Vernon Johns will eventually be fired or quit depending on the story, but you know, the deacons that run the church and um, they hire some, some newbie fresh out of seminary to come be the preacher uh, so they can control him. Um, and that was uh, some guy named Martin Luther King Jr. So the connections here and these stories are so powerful. So I want to make sure that kids understand the stories of Linda Brown and her sister and the other people that had these cases like Barbara Johns rolled into this because it makes for compelling, a compelling narrative. And the story of the court itself, as I mentioned earlier, it was argued once, then it's going to be re-argued. The court changes, you get a new Supreme Court just chief justice, right? Um, that is very important. David alluded to the fact that there is a political nature of this case. Uh, we're in the middle of the Cold War. And of course, the, the Russians, the communists love rubbing our noses in the fact that, you know, you have this superior society and yet you still treat a part of your society as second class citizens. There's so much. It's, the content is so rich. Uh, and unfortunately, for classroom teachers, we don't have the time to delve into all the details. Now, the other problem is, and I think what Dr. Hess was alluding to is like, and, and I think Mike and Tim said this is, is part of our narrative. It's part of our story, right? And we don't want to upset the apple cart. And David, you said this because it makes, you know, here we are. Oh, we're, we, we're getting better as a society. We're going to integrate our schools without looking at the backlash, without looking at the perhaps the negative effect of this case. And the, so people don't want to set, upset that apple cart. Uh, move fast forward to, as you alluded to, to um, the idea of teaching critical race theory. Now, I mean, teachers look over their shoulders because they're worried about talking about certain things like this because uh, the dealing with race at all has become a controversial subject yeah. in American classrooms, which is crazy because you can't truly tell the narrative of this nation without talking about race and how race has been treated. So um, I think part of it is that, I think what Dr. Hess was alluding to, was that teachers are reluctant or they don't know the history. That's part of it as well. They don't know the actual history in terms of the backlash and the perhaps negative effects of Brown. 
But the other part is they don't want to change that narrative of, you know, us bending that arc towards uh, justice. Um, so I think that there's a, a lot of things at play here, um, which is frustrating. And Mike, I didn't include you because I'm assuming there's no problem in ruffling feathers at the university level. Not at all. That's what we do. I, I think that um, I, I, I like every, everything Chris is saying is right on the mark. And I would it's a great story. I think it's also a case um, that I think teachers and students can use to look at a tension between equality and, and community. Because I, I think that um, the schools touch at like what your what your little community looks like, right? And who gets to be part of that community? And you know, if you look at the statistics today, um, the most segregated schools in America are mostly in cities where there is a vast majority of people who would identify as being liberal, small L liberal or capital L liberal, I guess. And it's the same kind of nimbyism tension, right? It's this idea of like, oh, in principle, equality is a great idea, but it's really, really hard um, to, to think about how that's going to affect my own community, maybe. And I think that Brown gives us a way to talk to students about that tension because they're familiar with what it means to go to a to a school. They're going to have that familiarity in ways other Supreme Court issues they might not. And students, nimbyism is not in my backyard, so... Uh, for those who didn't know that. Well, pr Professor Moore, you taught in a, uh, in a in a different environment than Chris and I did for uh, multiple decades. I'm curious how you, when you were once in the classroom of high school uh, kids. Yeah, you, you... Um, well, if I can conjure up memory here, uh, I, I will admit to not teaching Brown very well for a long time. I think I taught it uh, as as kind of an as a triumphal narrative, uh, we've talked about that the uh, arc of justice and uh, and then you know I started reading some stuff and um, talking to people uh, you know and uh, teaching is such an awful thing in the sense that you know when you start out as a young teacher you think you know a bunch and then if you're honest about teaching you learn how much you don't know. So it's like teachers that have been around a while in a lot of ways just owe like almost a whole generation of students like an apology uh, for how they taught it. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really, for me, it was a humbling thing that, wow, I kind of, I didn't really teach this very well. And, uh, and so it it really was, uh, and there have been, we had some professional development opportunities over the years, and I know uh, several of us had the opportunity to meet with Fred Shuttlesworth. That was a remarkable uh, weekend and his perspective on the civil rights movement. And, and I think one of the greatest moments in my life, uh, in my life is, is when uh, uh, David asked, Mr. maybe you can close in your closing remarks about that, that story. But you know, it's a it's a struggle to do. And I never really had any in a private Christian school. I never really had any problem. And when I started to teach Brown, because I would slow down, I'd sacrifice bits and pieces of the civil rights movement and slow way down on Brown, usually two to three days. Uh, and I never got any blowback. I think I think I became a better teacher because I, I knew more. And um, but it's it's a it was a struggle in uh, a humbling thing to realize you hadn't been teaching very well. So, Professor Williams, it seems to me that the only way to achieve, I mean, one of the things that the students have to deal with is uh, kind of where are we and where do we go from here? And it seems to me that the only way to achieve equal educational opportunities and outcomes is to mandate equal spending for every child in America. I'm wondering if you agree with me or do you think there are other alternatives uh, to that. And then I have a follow-up question after we deal with that. Yeah, I, I alluded to this earlier, but the, the name of the strategy that the NAACP was dealing with uh, before Brown came up was they were calling it Jim Crow Deluxe. And it was about making this argument about it's okay to have separate schools. Let's just fund them equally, right? Like it's, let's just make sure Thurgood Marshall did a, you know, a tour of the Southern schools and he saw with his own eyes what we already knew that they were woefully unfunded, right? So I think I think funding does um, have something definitely to do with it, but but to me, my thinking is a little different. Is that if we really want to get at this issue, you have to look at 
residential residential where people live, right? And you can, there's wonderful research out there, students. I'll try to find the site for this uh, on zip code research. And just based on the zip code you live in, that will determine your life expect expectancy. It determines how much you're going to make. And it, it's all based on this idea that we have a lot of zip codes where there's a concentration of poverty, which different there's different definitions of that. Is it 20% of the households in one zip code are, are below the federal poverty limit? Some use 40%. But the outcomes of that are, are pretty amazing. Are, are pretty dramatic. And so to get out that, what do you have to do? Well, you have to start thinking about what's a what's a livable wage for people? How do people have really the choice to move between neighborhoods? Um, our own housing policies that are woefully underfunded since the 1980s, even within those policies, the way you, if you're lucky enough to get off the 10 year wait period and get a section eight voucher, um, you know, the way the system works now, because we rely, rely upon private markets, is that landlords just up their, their rents for people who have vouchers because they know that it's guaranteed money that they can get. So to me, like, yes, we have to think about the funding. That's going to get you so far um, because you're going to have PTAs, you're going to have parents with more means who are going to be able to make up that gap. I mean, we have sports programs music programs, in some cases, counseling programs that are being paid for by parents, right, in neighborhoods where they have the means to do that. So just giving equal dollar amounts to every school kid, it's, it's not going to get at that issue. I think you really need to think about where people are living and living in neighborhoods where you don't have concentrations of poverty. I think that's, to me, what I've been learning is the root of this. There's so much, the Venn diagram in American society is so overlapping between race and poverty that it's hard like to pull those two out but i think that if you get at the concentration of poverty you would get out these you would get out these race issues in in a way where you would start seeing more integrated schools and start seeing schools that are performing um more, more in line with each other well i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do a half pushback okay good you, all right if if that's if there's such a thing and and i look at at the district you attended uh, Mike and the district that I taught in for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, and, and I, yeah, I make fun of bag on my community more than, uh, you know, <laughs> I feel, I feel I have a right to do so uh, there, but I will speak proudly that uh, we are the largest high school, we're a high school district, not a unified school district. We're the largest high school district that I know of, at least west of the Mississippi uh, there. And when it comes to state spending, all right, per student, it's equal, all right, in this district of, uh, of nearly 20 high schools, and that includes alternative high schools and such. Uh, so, you know, regardless of what neighborhood you live in, all right, and the fact is, is I would argue that the quality of teaching is equal, you know, regardless of what high school you go to, because, you know, the way the district hires, you know, just individual schools don't have the ability to hire teachers directly. The district does, and the district puts them uh, kind of, you know, where they need. And uh, you went to an inner city, overwhelmingly Latino, poor school, Mike. Uh, and I would say you got a pretty decent education uh, at that school. And it had a lot to do with the culture of the community and the equality. And again, to be quite honest, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, we had to go through some DSEG issues in the 70s uh, and stuff. Uh, so that's my half pushback that I do think that, you know, that spending does matter to a certain degree. Where you're right is that, and, and we see it, especially in the last 20 years, because in, in our community, we have an east-west split. We have the Highway 99 kind of goes right down the middle of, uh, of Bakersfield now. And on the west side of, of that, you have really the upper, you know, uh, income uh, uh, community. And then on the east side, uh, more middle and lower income there. But it's the supplemental monies that are available. The monies from that local high school community that are available uh, do make uh, uh, differences, not necessarily the programs that are offered, but the depth of which the programs that do exist uh, are uh, supported. Uh, 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 any, uh, Tim, uh, uh, Chris, any thoughts on that as far as, you know, uh, 
is is money the answer to the future of this problem of, of educational opportunity or I, I would it... agree I would agree with Mike that I think money is a is a part of it but uh, I think this idea of uh, really digging deep into what a community means and how it operates uh, that's a very I mean I'm not familiar with that that research at all but uh, being a communitarian it it resonates with me. Um, uh, so, so therefore, I, I think Mike's right. <laughs> well, I think that schools, uh, public schools are reflections of the community in which they exist. And so if you have a community that values education, mm -hmm. um, reg now I don't want to say regardless of spending, because that's not true, then you'll have schools that will perform. If you have schools that exist in communities where education is not as valued, then they're going to underperform. And I would, I, I would encourage the students to know the difference between the word equal and equity, because uh, there's differences between equal spending and equitable spending uh, for education. So make sure you understand that because there, there are differences. Um, but you know, you can tell what a society values by where it places its resources. And, yeah. you know, when, uh, you know, I happen to teach at a, a, where I used to teach, um, it was a it was a, a suburban community, predominantly white. Um, they valued education. And they were willing to put their money there. I mean, they built a uh, uh, before I left. They built a beautiful high school, as some of my friends would call the University of Plainfield High School, um, and it was a, phen a phenomenal facility. Um, so the community was willing to put their money where their mouth is. And but so much of it, I think, just to, it, schools are a reflection of the communities in which they exist. And, you know, if there's struggle within a community, the schools are going to struggle, right? If there's a cohesive nature to the community, regardless of who makes up that community, schools will do better. So I think they are a reflection, but certainly spending does come into play. Yeah. And the only thing I'd add is that, you know, I mean, so, so you have, you have a, a family who's living in a, in a part of a neighborhood where there's a concentration of poverty, they're going to a school and there's the same amount of dollars for that kid as every other kid, right? But but there are ramifications and consequences of living um, in poverty. I mean, there are, there's food insecurity, there's, um, do you have to get a part-time job? There's now, there's a lot of evidence out there of health implications in terms of just being stressed more. And when we're stressed, we don't make as good as, as decisions. So I, you know, I think about I think about it even, yeah, even if it's the same amount of money and even the school that Dave's referring to, East Bakersfield High, right? I completely agree. I do think if we were to dig down into the data, I, I think if you want, I think there would be some correlations from people at East High, depending on what, what part of the community they were coming from in terms of socioeconomics and their, and their performance in school. I still think there's going to be a correlation there. And I think it has to do with this broader lack of resources of what happens to them when they go home. Right. And what's, what's, what's for them there. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump back in here. Sorry. Uh, well, I think the, the COVID pandemic really demonstrated this when you talk about access to the internet, right. Uh, you know, to have that ability um, during COVID when so many, so much stuff went to remote and, you know, um, I can just speak from experience, you know, having kids that uh, that was that was a, that was a struggle because of their environment. It was very much a struggle to actually find a quiet space in a crowded apartment uh, when they could actually have access to the Internet. Um, I think, too, if you come from a home where uh, the parents uh, had the benefit of a perhaps higher education, uh, then they're going to stress that from the beginning of your education on up. Not always, I mean, but there's a tendency, I think numbers will bear this out, that, you know, that education is going to be stressed. If you come from a home where perhaps parents struggle socioeconomically, then um, that education is perhaps not going to be stressed as much. And I'm not saying that's total for everybody. I know there are always exceptions, but uh, when you, uh, just to underscore what Mike was just saying, when you come from a socioeconomic where there is an expectation of, of um, performance, I mean, because, you know, we have to consider, we're talking about schools and spending, but we also have to consider the, the other people and that's the parents and the kids. 
you know, they have a stake in this as well. So I think when you see those parents that come from a, perhaps a socioeconomic that's a little higher, then the education is going to be stressed a little bit more. So, Mike, I, you know, to, I, I was wondering if the global community, if there's <laughs> offers the United States some answers to this, or are we just so unique in our demographics and our history that there's really no model out there amongst the international community that can can help us out? Yeah, and um, I don't know. I didn't know a lot about this topic and the research. So I did a little research on this. And what I found was um, that at least in Europe and um, and looking at Canada, the similar kind of issues there in terms of segregation, more based on socioeconomic. So thinking about class, I guess, and also in Europe, thinking about different types of immigrants coming to communities. Um, and it, they're dealing with the same kind of issues that neighborhoods tend to be somewhat segregated, not by law, but maybe by, I don't even want to say by choice. It's by what folks, where they folks can afford to live. And that therefore they're seeing the same similar sorts of, I guess, achievement issues where kids in those schools are not achieving at the same level of more, I guess, middle class schools. I I found that, I found literature on that both in Canada and in, in European countries. And they're not dealing at all with the same kind of legacy of, of, of racism and discrimination that we are in the United States. So I think what we're dealing with is probably degree wise, uh, a little harder than other places, but I, uh, all places are dealing with this and or advanced democracies are dealing with this issue of, of education achievement gaps and where people are living. Yeah, we could uh, commit an entire program to this, just this one issue, because it is so complex. I mean, one of the things that that I, I you know, because I, I don't have unlimited time, I, even though you, you may think I, I do, but uh, uh, I, I'm curious about how, how did African-American students perform in segregated schools um, before Brown and before, you know, the 60s when it really st starts to heat up as far as desegregation there, I you know, because, because Mike, you talked about poverty, uh, and schools, and I think about my parents and the the Great Depression, uh, and both of my parents, although they didn't go on to to, to higher education, they were both phenomenally well educated, you know, uh, from high school education, and they came from both fairly impoverished uh, uh, family situations. Uh, there and I and I wonder about you know looking at that data, and I know it's so complex that that's maybe too simplistic. Uh, uh, there. Uh, so, you know, I guess I wish I, I wish students luck on that uh, issue as far as where do we go from here on as trying to address this issue. And so I'll ask the three of you uh, in our traditional uh, approach to things as we uh, wrap up our hour together uh, to provide final recommendations and thoughts uh, to students and teachers as they prepare for this question. And I think it's a great question on Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, uh, Professor Kavanaugh. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I think this is a, it's a, can be considered a controversial topic, though it really shouldn't be. Uh, honestly, it shouldn't be a controversial topic because we're talking about how do we treat all people uh, equally under the law? I mean, this is, it's really that simple, uh, but maybe it's not that simple. Um, maybe it might be a little more complex. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just a high school teacher. Um, but th the thing is, is, uh, you know, again, I pointed this out earlier, uh, just me being me, you know, is, is race, race relations law, not race relations is race relations law. How much is a follow through behind that? Um, you know, clearly, clearly our situation has gotten better, but we're not there yet. And it's an ongoing experiment. So the students make sure you understand that. And again, if you believe that there we have issues, uh, which I think most people would say that we still have issues of race in this country, how do we alleviate those? How do we move those forward? How do we fix it? You know, if, if our, our generation uh, couldn't deal with it, what 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 would you change? And think about where's the next great case going to come from? We've mentioned several here on the program 
obviously starting with Brown, which is the, at the heart of this question, but the question also alludes to other cases. So what is the next great rights case uh, coming up? And there could be a number of them. So what do you, you know, what do you see on the horizon as the next struggle or this on, I mean, it's clearly it's an ongoing struggle, but where is, do you think is the next struggle? It'd be interesting to see what young people and how they would approach that. Professor Moore. Yeah, I, I, I've been um, thinking about, I mean, <laughs> uh, Brown is such a fast, and you, I, if you've been paying attention, hang in there, hang in there, guys. I, I know guys is long. But what we've been talking about is the case as law. We've also been talking about the case as it's just, there's all kinds of social issues. And I, I, you know, I know this is kind of a, a pet peeve of mine in We the People. I think often people can get really enamored, especially if you first are introduced to case law. It's quite cool. It's really kind of interesting. But uh, I think at some point you have to wrestle with the fact that, I mean, Chris, Chris's argument about Brown is a fascinating case independent of the of the case. There's stories. There's all kinds of social issues within this within this case. So hopefully you've heard us talk about some of these other silos, categories, being a political scientist here. There's all kinds of categories that you can that are important in this case. And so I, I would urge students to don't look at it just as a legal thing. It's much broader than that. Professor Williams. Yeah, I'm going to echo what Chris and Tim just said, and then I think I have something new to say. So to Tim's comment, I would say um, students look at Brown as a yes and example. Like, yes, court maybe came up with a decision that was in the right direction, but then the and is, and how is this then picked up by civil rights groups? Um, um, you know, <laughs> read what Stokely Carmichael had to say about what he thought about. <laughs> Brown. Um, you know, there was there's there was disagreement within the black community. I mean, the black community itself was against busing in the 1970s. So, I would say use it as a, a good marker, maybe to start thinking about the social and political um, outcomes. And then to Chris's point, I would, um, to me, this is about enforcement, right? It's about like, what do you have the political will to enforce it? I, I think Aristotle was the first person I would heard use this idea that laws do not change the hearts of men, right, or of people. And yeah, but I think there's a step in between there. It's laws, behavior, and then hearts. And laws only change behavior if those laws are enforced. And believe me, students, take a look at our history. We knew how to enforce redlining. There was political will behind making sure that certain neighborhoods, yeah. certain people did not get loans. So it's not that we didn't have the political will to do this big stuff. I don't think with the integration of, of schools or even the desegregation that we've had that political will. So uh, I would be thinking about the role of that. and. The new thing I would say is, I guess, especially if you're a, if you're a, um, a, a I think I, I'm just going to call it, if you're a white student right now thinking about Brown, to I, I would try to decenter yourself, right? I think there's some saviorism, like the doll test, this idea of like, oh, if only little black kids could be with little white kids, they'd feel better about themselves. It's so like, 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 um, here come the whites to 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 save communities, right? And when you start learning the history and thinking about about what happened to black communities in this process of this saviorism, as Dave's already kind of talked about, think about that perspective, I guess, and think about what black communities were already doing in in the midst of Jim Crow in terms of educating, and what they're doing now in the midst of of what we have now. So, um, I would I would ask you just to think about about how you perceive what Brown was about um, from that perspective. Well, to add on to what my colleagues uh, have said, uh, in the years that I taught uh, uh, government, uh, we the people, civics, my first day I would have this written on the board 
uh, as something I would ask my kids to always remember as we talked about law and culture. Law is only as good as the ability and willingness to enforce that law. And, uh, you know, either I don't know if Brown's a badly written or badly decided law, but I do know, because it echoes what happens in Reconstruction, is that our other institutions that Mr. Moore talked about uh, lost the ability and willingness to enforce the spirit and the content of Brown. And that's partly why we are where we are, are at uh, today in the 21st century. The last thing I want to mention is I just I, I send out wishes or, or hopes uh, to those students who are in states that have banned certain elements of teaching race in the uh, classroom uh, there, because I do wonder if this question uh, offends those laws uh, in, in, in those states uh, uh, there. So good luck to those states <laughs> that may have, and those teachers that may have to battle uh, their state laws. Uh, when we meet next time, we're going to be looking uh, at Unit 1, going back to our philosophical and historical traditions and uh, the social contract rights versus the common good. Until then, peace, love, yogurt tacos, bye-bye, bye bonds.